The scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. The words of Paul written to the, effect, to the church in Ephesus by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Be angry, but do not sin. And don't let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Amen. Thank you, brother. Good morning, Mesa. I'm a little bit different face than you may have been expecting today, but I am here, and you may be intrigued by things that are up here. I hope so. Those watching at home will have the best view, um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that a little bit later on. This is a lesson that I actually did for our teenagers a couple weekends ago at an area-wide retreat that we did, and specifically the weekend was built around processing our emotions. And I'm only going to share one of them with you today, but it bears thinking, and there's some things that kind of overflow, and the tools that we're going to look at today when we talk about anger that can be used for some of these other emotions as well. So first and foremost, I actually want you guys to answer me a little bit today. What emotions have you felt this last year? In 2020... If you were to shout out an emotion that you have felt over the last year, what would that emotion be? Frustration. Frustration. Give me some more. Crying. Crying. Sadness. Anger. Anger. What else? Thankfulness. Thankfulness. Joy. Hopelessness. I know this is weird in this auditorium at this time, isn't it? This goes against our nature to like shout out an emotion that we're feeling, doesn't it? We focused ourselves over that weekend on five different emotions that I think all of us have experienced in 2020. I think a lot of us experienced fear. I think we experienced anger. An emotion that we might not think of that we definitely have experienced is disgust. I think there has been more than a fair share of sadness. And most importantly, when we process our emotions correctly, hopefully you experience joy. And we're going to look at some of the tools if we deal with our anger in a godly way that maybe will help us to have joy while having anger present as an emotion that we feel. I want you guys to reflect on this question. What is it that makes you angry? What gets your goat? What pushes your buttons? Whatever old-timey saying to represent what really gets you riled up. And start thinking about some of those things. It's interesting because anger has been expressed very loudly over the last year for a lot of people. I think that anger has manifested itself in the last year in the form of riots, protests, angry posts and rants that people are posting all over social media. You may not realize this, but domestic violence and abuse is at an all-time high in our country right now. Suicide and self-harm are greater than they've been historically as well. Some of the demographic that has experienced this emotion the most are our teenagers. Statistically speaking, studies have shown that children, ninth grade to 12th grade, or teenagers, young adults, whatever you want to call them, rely on their social network for emotional well-being more than any other age group. So imagine your emotional unwell-being that you've experienced the last year, and imagine if you had experienced it during those formative times with raging hormones and everything else. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, how should we process? How should we express 
our anger. What is it that we do when we get angry? It's always interesting when you talk to teenage boys, they talk about like a physical outlet for their anger. Like I went and I punched a tree and now I broke my hand and that was a very poor decision. There's a lot of us that never get beyond that coping mechanism for trying to deal with our anger. And that's why you see those guys on the golf course throwing their clubs. We all come up with different tools, but we need godly tools when it comes to processing our emotions. When it comes to anger, I think we have three things that we can do with it. We can bottle it, where we just sort of swallow it like, in, like a meal that isn't going to sit well. We can express it without any thought and no filter. And we all have those moments, don't we, where like we just speak it without thinking whatsoever. And the third one is we can actually stop and examine the emotion and what's going on before we take action. Those are the three real ways that we can deal with anger. And if we break it down into those three categories, it makes it easier for us to understand. But here's something that I want to get out there first and foremost. Emotions are not bad. Emotions are there for a reason. Your anger is there for a reason. Your sadness is there for a reason. They have a positive and a negative way of being expressed and experienced, but they are all meant for a purpose and for a reason. Ecclesiastes 3 puts it this way, starting in verse 1. It says, there is a time for everything. And a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and yes, a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, okay, that may be pointed at 2020, but probably not, I think it's talking about something else, a time to search, and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Our emotions are good. Anger really falls into two categories, doesn't it? Righteous anger and sinful anger. Those are the two ways that you can slice it and end up with a clear picture of what anger is. A few other verses to give us context that anger itself isn't bad. You can look in Ephesians 4 and 26. It says, in your anger, do not sin. If you want some alternative reading, Psalms 4 is a pretty angry psalm. A lot of it seems to be directed at God, but specifically it says, be angry and do not sin. So the Bible lays it out very clearly that our anger can either be righteous or sinful, and that's really what it comes down to. And that's up to us and how we process it and how we deal with it. So we have to ask ourselves, what's the difference between a righteous anger and a sinful anger? What do we do, what we do with our anger determines whether it's negative or positive. First off and foremost, Bottling our anger is a sinful way of dealing with that emotion. It can hurt us in incredibly deep ways if we choose to swallow an emotion that's an indicator, a warning light of something that's not right in our life. If we swallow it long enough, it can become part of our identity. It leads to explosion of anger over things that really don't deserve that kind of volatility. It can lead to pain, saying things in the moment that you just don't mean. And no matter how many times we say sorry, those words are still out there. That pain is still felt. And this is something that comes to us very naturally. 
Just the other night, I was uh, putting my daughter to bed, and she had a massive meltdown. She wasn't getting what she wanted. She was overtired. We probably should have put her to bed two hours earlier. And in that moment of crying and yelling and screaming, she said, Daddy, I don't love you. That gets you in the feels, doesn't it? Those of you that have had kids know what I'm talking about. It's not that she didn't love me. It was that she didn't know how to express what she was feeling any other way. And we've all done that. We've all said things that we wish we could take back that we just can't. Anger is meant to be expressed. It is meant to lead us to action. So when is anger positive? When is it righteous? Righteous anger is God, a godly reaction to sin or injustice. God's wrath is him seated in opposition or against sin. In fact, most biblical references to anger are references to God's anger, not our human understanding of anger where it's directed at a person. Jesus was angry without sinning. When he encountered unbelief and hypocrisy, those are things that bring out what I like to call spicy Jesus. That's that angry Jesus who flipped over tables and chased people with a whip. He did that without sinning. That same Jesus also got really spicy with the Pharisees. And he said, you are whitewashed tombs. Essentially, he called them dead. And there's a whole bunch of implications wrapped up in the things that he would say to the Pharisees in his anger and as he expressed those things. Jesus, after an angry encounter with the Pharisees and flipping over tables, told a fig tree to die. Joshua preached on that about a month ago. We can look at all kinds of examples of how God has been angry without sinning, how Jesus has been angry without sinning. So if we want to become like Jesus, we too are going to be angry. We're going to feel hatred towards hypocrisy and injustice. When we see a child being abused, we will not be able to stand by and just watch. When we see injustice in the world, we will not be able to just turn a blind eye. And we're talking about righteous anger over righteous things of God. The first step in dealing with our anger is to be honest about our anger. It's to stop and it's to analyze that anger. It's to ask ourselves the question of, is my anger righteous or is it sinful? Is it a mixture of both? Is this just all wrapped up and confused? God has used this question approach for a long time. One of the first examples we see of anger expressed within the Bible is with Cain and Abel, isn't it? In Genesis 4, God goes to Cain and he asks him, why are you angry? Is God seeking information? No. He knows why Cain's angry. He's trying to get Cain to think about why Cain is angry. It's about shifting it to a godly perspective. God goes on and he exhorts Cain and he tells him, you would do well because sin is crouching at your door and it's ready to devour you. But Cain ignored God's counsel and he murdered his brother. Anger for sin. This can be a useful tool because when we find ourselves angry at the things that anger God, it's no longer tempting, is it? It removes the power of temptation when we are grieved, saddened, and angered by the things that grieve, sadden, and anger God. It's about having our heart and our emotions in line with God's. So, there's nothing wrong with anger. All of us are going to become angry. Jesus is going to be angry. What's important is how we deal with it. 
The first place that I want to look is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. And you guys heard this just a minute ago. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. If you drop down to verse 31, it says also, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. All of those are actions that come from anger, aren't they? Negative expressions of anger. So, to help us understand anger a little bit better, I'm going to make you guys a smoothie today. I'm going to give you something physical to look at to hopefully understand this concept a little bit more. You guys are really lucky because you're in a big auditorium. And normally I do this in a small classroom with teenagers, and the smell can be quite terrible. Those of you watching at home, you got the best seat in the house because you won't smell a thing. So we are going to add some ingredients to this and see how our life transforms when we start allowing anger to be mismanaged and mishandled. Do you guys remember the commercials for milk? Does a body good, strong teeth, healthy bones. Oh wait, that's the old advertising campaign. The new one's all about precious proteins, isn't it? But that's like a whole other thing that I can get sidetracked on with marketing and how we change things. You may notice that this milk carton doesn't look so good. It's a little swollen. I'm a little afraid to open this. What happens to milk when you just leave it out in the heat? It goes bad. It turns sour. And that's exactly what has happened here. (laughs) Yummy. When we don't deal with our anger, when we choose to bottle it, when we choose to ignore it, it turns us bitter. It turns us sour. And this is the first stage of mismanaging our anger. There's nothing wrong with milk, but when milk turns bad, it is no good. When we choose to bottle our emotions and not deal with them, it can turn us bitter and sour. When I was younger, I dealt with some things within my home that I chose, instead of expressing what I was feeling, to bottle them. And it led me into atheism. It led me to a place of deciding that there was no God because of the things that I had experienced. And I turned bitter, and I turned sour, And I made it my mission to destroy other people's faith so that I could feel better about myself. Make sure this is closed. It led me to a place of depression, a place of suicidal thoughts. It took me to a very deep, dark place because I chose not to process my emotions and I thought that I could bottle them and it turned me sour. The first tool that I want to give you guys for expressing your anger is how can you express your anger without being critical? Let me kind of explain that a little bit more. There's a difference between expressing anger and expressing hurt or criticism. Feeling like you're being ignored is not an emotion. Feeling lonely or unseen is is an emotion. Feeling like someone thinks you're stupid isn't an emotion. Not feeling understood or feeling withdrawn, these are emotions. Feeling like someone is a jerk? No, that's not an emotion. Feeling unsafe is. And I know you may be saying, okay, this is, this is really nitpicky in our communication, isn't it? But it's important because if we can remove criticism while expressing emotion, the person listening to us will be more likely to respond to the feeling because they don't feel attacked. They don't feel like they have to be defensive about what's going on. It leaves them the freedom 
to speak to the emotion that you're feeling. The less criticism that we can infuse into our emotions, the more likely they are to hear us and the more likely they are to attend to our emotional needs and feelings. Well, anger doesn't stop there. If we continue to bottle it, if we continue to ignore it, if we continue to not process it, eventually over time, it's not just something that's sour, where if you look at, you know, some milk from a distance, you might not realize how angry that person is. But eventually, our anger becomes visible to others from the outside. And now we have this nice strawberry slurry inside here. Is anybody feeling, you know, like this is a good meal for you? It looks disgusting. I'm, I'm glad you're not up here smelling it with me. Step two of anger is when we start to carry it with us all the time. No matter how hard we try to hide it, this anger is deep down in our heart, and it comes out in certain circumstances. Maybe it's expressed when, for your teenager, when you ask them to clean their room or to do a chore, and it seems like this giant explosion that has nothing to do with cleaning. That could be some misplaced anger. You may find that coworker who gets upset when you do something slightly wrong. That could be some bottled, misplaced anger. And after a while, you realize that you're walking on eggshells around these types of people because their anger is always right there at the surface. It is always ready to boil over. And we can see that in people from a distance, can't we? We can recognize those angry people that are not processing or handling their anger correctly, and we don't want to come near them, do we? Proverbs 29.11 says, Fools give vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. Exploding with anger isn't the answer. We have another ingredient. Mineral oil. Does anybody know what mineral oil tastes like? Does anybody know what it smells like? Believe it or not, there's not much to mineral oil. You can't really smell it. It doesn't have a strong taste. And it's pretty much invisible, isn't it? If we carry our anger long enough, we become blind to it. We can't even recognize that we're angry or what we're angry about or that anger is even present in our life. It doesn't change this mixture much, but we don't have the ability to deal with our anger anymore. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Sometimes we bury things so deeply in our heart that we begin to respond to every situation with anger and we're completely blind to the tone that we use. Have you ever met that person that constantly has like that angry tone? They're completely oblivious to it. They have no idea that the tone they're communicating in is that way. And it comes from holding this anger so tight without looking at it, without processing it. Luke chapter 6 and verse 45 says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil out of the evil things stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The last stage of anger is pretty gross. I don't know if you guys have ever sat down and thought about, what is the cat food of choice for me? I chose something real fishy because I think it's disgusting, and it is. Technically, you could probably eat this, but nobody wants anything to do with that. It is absolutely disgusting. It is gross. It is terrible. I apologize, those of you in the front row that may be smelling that. Anger, when undealt with, transforms into contempt and bitterness. Contempt is simply hate. It's a disregard for individuals where we see them as lesser, where we devalue them as a part of society or even as a human being. The problem is we were all created to belong. We were all created in God's image. We were all created for community with each other. 
And when we reject other people, we reject, we reject God's plan for the world. Contempt and bitterness is what anger turns into over time. I would call this a sin that is fully grown. A sin that takes a person captive. A sin that enslaves a person to where they no longer have the ability to deal with it. I want to look at some tools to deal with our anger. Oh, I forgot that I had these. There you go. Matthew 5 has some great tools. We talked about a lot of the negative that we saw in that verse. We know the destructiveness of anger. But there's some stuff in Matthew 25, 21 through 26 for us. And it reads this way. You have heard it was said of old, you shall not murder, and whosoever murders is liable to judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother is liable for judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the fires of hell. Hold on, Jesus. You just made this a lot harder. Why is Jesus drawing a line in a different place? Because if you want to start processing your anger in a healthy way, don't wait until it's being expressed in a negative way. Start drawing the line way back over here where you have to start processing it completely different from stage one from the very beginning. And then it will not boil over. It will not take root. It will not take over your life. God is saying, stop and look at it. Analyze it. Look at all of these different little facets that lead to anger. In fact... He goes on in verse 24, he says, Leave your gift there before the altar and first go and be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. God says it's more important for you to reconcile with your brother than it is to offer sacrifices to him. That's big. That means I can't go around using sarcasm however I want, not thinking about the feelings and the emotions that I'm evoking in others. I love sarcasm. It's one of my favorite forms of expression. I have had to give up a lot of sarcasm because I have recognized that not all people take sarcasm the same way. I have left people crying over what I thought was a funny joke. And it led me back to this verse of what am I really communicating a value to somebody? A joke or something eternal? Something for building up or something for just a quick laugh? And that's a whole other side note that you guys can take wherever you want. That's just something that I have had to change about myself because I want to be used for building up. So what tools do we find in Matthew? We find essentially a GPS for dealing with our anger. First, we have to go to the person with whom we're angry. We have to be honest, and we have to confess our anger to them. You remember how earlier we talked about not expressing criticism in that anger? This falls in right here. Have you guys ever heard the concept of venting before you deal with your anger? That's not the biblical model that's laid out in Matthew 5. The biblical model is if we're angry with somebody, we go and talk to them. The best way I know how to express this is imagine that you're newlyweds and that your wife and you get in a fight. And she says, I can't deal with you. And she walks away and goes and talks to her mother about the problem to gain perspective. And she counsels her through it. But you know what the mother-in-law never sees? The heartfelt apology and reconciliation. And over time, that's going to taint her view of her son-in-law, isn't it? Because over time, she's only going to hear the problems and the dysfunction, but not the beautiful stories of healing. This is just one example of how not going directly to that person first. And you know what we call it when we go to somebody else about a problem that isn't theirs? We call that gossip. And that's a whole other thing. 
So we have to be careful of how we engage in venting or other tools that we may have been told that aren't biblical tools for dealing with our anger. The second tool is to pray. We need to pray for God's forgiveness. We need to ask God to reveal in our hearts what part of this argument, what part of this this dysfunction is ours. Because at the end of the day, I cannot cause someone else to change. But I can take responsibility for my own actions. And if I'm not aware of them, I can't change them. So you need to start praying to God about the things that you're angry about and asking him to reveal what part of it is yours. Because I can guarantee you, no matter how righteous your argument was with that person, there's probably a slice of that anger and that dysfunction that's yours. However small it may be or however big it may be. And that's your responsibility to take care of that part of it. And lastly, you need to seek Seek forgiveness from the person that you have been angry with. Do, we know, do you guys know why forgiveness is so hard? It's because the hurt matters. Forgiveness is not about anything other than no longer being dependent on somebody else to right that wrong. When we choose to forgive someone, we're releasing them from owning us with that emotion. When we fail to forgive others, all we do are bind ourselves to that emotion of anger, betrayal, hate, whatever it may be. So use your GPS. I know that's really cheesy, but I like cheesy sometimes. Go, pray, and seek. Lastly, I want to leave you with this verse. Romans 13 says this, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continued debt of love for one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. That's a great place to start when processing and dealing with our anger, when dealing with any emotion that we face. I hope there were some useful tools in there for you guys to think about when it when you find yourself angry again. In a minute, we're going to sing a song. If you have need of prayers, if you have need of the church to stand by you, this is a great time. I want to encourage you to come and meet with the elders. Meet with those that want to walk alongside you and to help equip you with the tools that you need to be able to deal with the emotions you experience. Jesus is-